From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Donald Trump on trial in two venues in the same day, obviously for different legal purposes. While his hush money trial continues in New York, the Supreme Court hears arguments over Trump's claim that he has immunity from prosecution for official acts. It's a potentially landmark case that has implications for every future president, not just Donald Trump. Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo with the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages here on our Potomac Watch podcast. And I'm here with uh, my colleagues, uh, Kyle Peterson and Kim Strassel. Welcome to you both. So a big day. Let's listen to excerpts from the opening arguments for both sides. First, Donald Trump's attorney, John Sauer, and then Michael Dreben, who is counsel for the government. Without presidential immunity from criminal prosecution, there can be no presidency as we know it. For 234 years of American history, no president was ever prosecuted for his official acts. The framers of our Constitution viewed an energetic executive as essential to securing liberty. If a president can be charged, put on trial, and imprisoned for his most controversial decisions as soon as he leaves office, that looming threat will distort the president's decision-making precisely when bold and fearless action is most needed. This court has never recognized absolute criminal immunity for any public official. Petitioner, however, claims that a former president has permanent criminal immunity for his official acts unless he was first impeached and convicted. His novel theory would immunize former presidents for criminal liability for bribery, treason, sedition, murder, and here conspiring to use fraud to overturn the results of an election and perpetuate himself in power. Such presidential immunity has no foundation in the Constitution. Well, there you have it, framing the questions at hand on both sides of the argument. Kyle, pretty expansive arguments on both sides there. They're framing it in in really broad terms, broader than I think the Supreme Court will ultimately decide based on the questioning we heard at this uh, oral argument. Just a little backdrop here, the um, legal context Both sides are correct. The Supreme Court has never addressed this question of absolute immunity for former presidents, presidents from criminal prosecution. It has, however, addressed the question of immunity from civil lawsuits, and it did so in a 1982 case, Nixon v. Fitzgerald, and found that the president does have absolute immunity from civil lawsuits for acts that are within the outer perimeter, and that's the phrase the court used, the outer perimeter of his official duties. So the question for the court is whether the principles enunciated in Nixon v. Fitzgerald would apply in criminal cases. The government says no, Kyle. Yeah, to provide a little bit more context so that Nixon v. Fitzgerald case 1982 was brought by a management analyst with the Department of the Air Force who testified before Congress and then was subsequently dismissed from his job. And he sued several people, including the president at the time, Richard Nixon. And the argument at the Supreme Court, and that's what the Supreme Court eventually held, was that the president has absolute immunity from these kinds of civil suits within the outer perimeter of his official duties. If you're laid off by the Air Force, you can't sue the president of the United States. And I think the similar argument holds in the criminal context here. There's all sorts of things that are alleged in the January 6th indictment brought by Jack Smith, including that the president was talking to Vice President Mike Pence and urging him to take some sort of actions in the joint session of Congress. And it seems to me that that is an official action by the president that he cannot be criminally prosecuted for after the fact. But I agree with you that some sweeping arguments on both sides and the justices seem to be groping for for a way to draw the line in the middle somewhere that would protect official actions of presidents and and allow the president to do his job as we normally think of it, while also not protecting the president if he does something like accepts a bribe for appointing somebody as an ambassador. Yeah, the essence of the questioning in most cases was to zero in on this point of at least the president has some immunity, it would seem, Kim. And Michael Dreben, the counsel for the government, basically arguing that the Nixon v. Fitzgerald principle doesn't apply to prosecutions from criminal 
criminal actions because there's actually less need for a president to worry about those prosecutions <laughs> than he has to worry about civil suits because anybody can sue anywhere for a civil action. But prosecutors, of course, have the prosecutorial power. And he argued that they would be more restrained because well, they have the prosecutorial canons of when you can bring a case. They uh, are bound by having enough evidence to be able to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. And it was fascinating to me, and I think telling for the way this case might go, that Chief Justice John Roberts, for example, questioned Dreben on this and said, really, do you really think that prosecutors might not ever <laughs> decide to bring a case that uh, might be somewhat iffy on evidence? And he zeroed in on the D.C. Circuit's previous ruling, the appellate court, from which this case is being appealed, that reading their opinion as saying the fact of prosecution was enough to justify prosecution of a former president. And he found that position wanting. And I didn't think Dreben did a very effective job of answering that. I think the word he used was, isn't that a tautological statement that because you have indicted the president, therefore the president can be indicted? <laughs> it was a good moment. Just on this point about civil versus criminal liability, in one way, the argument that Dreben is making is somewhat nonsensical. If you think about it, if we have agreed that there should be some sort of civil immunity for a president acting within the perimeter of his duties, you would in some ways assume that that would obviously also apply to a criminal situation because criminal cases are so much more serious than civil. So in some ways, you could argue that Nixon B. Fitzgerald was setting a lower bar and that Dreamin has it the wrong way around. This argument, yes, John Roberts did a good job. He said, really, we need to just trust in the good faith of prosecutors. And when Dreben came back and said, well, it's not just the prosecutors. You know, this had to go in front of a, a grand jury. Roberts was similarly dismissive, noting he didn't exactly use the line, but the old line about how prosecutors can get grand juries to essentially indict a ham sandwich. So that's not much of a guard whatsoever. Uh, look, I think one bit of evidence that is not helping Dreben and Jack Smith at the moment is that we already have four Democratic prosecutors that have gone after this president. This is obviously not an unusual situation, as the D.C. Circuit argued that somehow Donald Trump was sui generis and that you would never get another president like this. But I noticed that Samuel Alito was bringing up some acts that prior presidents had done and wouldn't they count, certainly have been prosecutable. He in particular mentioned FDR and his treatment of Japanese Americans during the war. Putting them in internment camps. In internment camps, correct. Whether or not someone might have sued over that or he might have been prosecuted for that later. We on our pages had a good piece from David Rivkin, our contributor, talking about other acts Abraham Lincoln and his suspension of habeas corpus, Truman and his commandeering of steel plants, which was overturned by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. So we might not have had prosecutors in the past who are willing to do this, but I think an argument hanging over the court is that the partisan furies have been unleashed with these cases and the very high possibility that if there is no immunity whatsoever, that every president is facing the possibility of future prosecution on a criminal basis. All right, we're going to take a break and when we come back more on this fascinating oral argument on immunity for presidents when we come back. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo here on Potomac Watch with Kyle Peterson and Kim Strassel. And let's listen to Justice Katanji Brown Jackson questioning the counsel for Donald Trump. Talk about her concerns about presidential immunity. You seem to be worried about the president being chilled. I think that we would have a really significant opposite problem if the president wasn't chilled. If someone with those kinds of powers, the most powerful person in the world, with the greatest amount of authority, um, could go into office knowing that there would be no potential penalty for committing crimes. I'm trying to understand what the disincentive is from turning the Oval Office into, um, you know, the, 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 the seat of criminal activity in this country. Kyle, seat of criminal activity. She, t she <laughs> seems to clearly be taking a uh, expansive view of what presidential powers would be. I didn't think Dreben did a particularly good job of, uh, not Dreben, uh, Sauer, of responding to that. But that is the concern here, that somehow if you give president immunity, he would be able to do just about 
anything. Trump thinks that's what he should be able to do, but I don't think the justices do. They're focusing on a narrower set of official actions. But Justice Kagan zeroed in on the question, well, could he support a military coup or call for a military coup? What what do you think about that line of concern? Well, I think it's a very important thing to underline because there were several justices that were trying to figure out the answer to this question. So Chief Justice John Roberts brought up this example of somebody who accepts a bribe to appoint the briber into an ambassadorship. And he was saying, if the appointing of the ambassadorship is the official action, then can you still be charged with accepting the bribe? And what would that indictment look like? It would look like the president of the United States accepted a million dollars, dot, 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 dot. And so it was fascinating to watch them try to figure out the answer to that question. The attorney for Donald Trump seemed to say that there were precedents that had allowed those kinds of prosecutions in the past. But there's whole scopes of activity that I think would not be covered by uh, any sort of official immunity. And this Kagan back and forth, I thought, was pretty good with the attorney for Donald Trump. So she asked the defendant, meaning Donald Trump, signed a lawsuit in Georgia alleging election fraud. Is that official or unofficial conduct? And the attorney said that would be unofficial. Okay, what about Donald Trump called the Speaker of the House in Arizona, asking him to get the legislature in session to look at a fraud hearing. And so that, according to the Trump attorney, would be official conduct, the president communicating with state officials. And so what we may end up with here is a ruling providing some kind of immunity allowing the president to do his job while sending it back down to the lower courts to figure out in this specific case with Donald Trump what is official and what is not. Well, Kyle, you preempted me here because I have a clip from that Kagan exchange, which I think gets to the heart of the matter. Let's listen to Justice Kagan question John Sauer. The defendant called the chairwoman of the Republican National Committee, asked her to gather electors in targeted states, falsely represented to her that such electors' votes would be used only if ongoing litigation in one of the states changed the results in the defendant's favor. We have taken the position that that is official. That's official? Yes. Why would that be official? Because the organization of alternate slates of electors is for, based on, for example, the historical uh, uh, example of President Grant is something that was done pursuant to and ancillary and preparatory to the exercise of the core recommendation clause power. So when President Trump couldn't, was, couldn't he have taken this action just in the status of a candidate? The fact that he could have done so doesn't demonstrate that he did do so in this case. And based on the allegations, we think it's clear he did not, that this was done in an official capacity. There we have it, Kim. That just really does get to the heart of the matter, because after you've decided the question of a president having some immunity, which a lot of the the justices spent time figuring out, then you get to the question, okay, for what? And uh, what acts fall within the outer perimeter? The uh, counsel for Trump arguing that they're contacting those electors would be an official action. And their briefs suggest that's because he has an obligation as president to try to make sure that the elections are fairly and honestly conducted. And then Justice Kagan questions, somewhat skeptical of that, arguing that, well, that's implying in her question that that is not an official action. It's actually in the context of him running for president (laughs) and trying to get reelected. And that's, I think, going to be a big part of how this plays out is where you come down on those questions, because let's assume that the court does decide that there is some immunity for the president. He has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for those official actions. Then the question becomes, okay, what actions are those? And then there'll be the debate over those. Now, the Supreme Court could decide that in this case itself, at least provide some guidance. I suspect they won't, that the justices will, in fact, remand that down to the trial judge to have fact finding on whether or not and some judgment about whether or not those actions are official. Yeah. And when that happens, by the way, or if that happens, watch Democrats heads explode. I mean, they're already gearing up to be furious if that is a judgment of this court, because, of course, and maybe this is my cynical read, I apologize for always being so cynical. But if you are of the belief that this case was brought in part because there are many on the left that would rather not see Donald Trump. Trump be qualified to actually sit in office again, then the whole goal of this is to get this done and dusted before anybody casts a vote and before he could potentially obtain higher office and then pardon himself or shut this prosecution down, as it were, in some way. And so they're going to be really unhappy. My argument to that is that the court has no obligation whatsoever to 
follow an election timeline as it goes along in this case. This is a very, very serious discussion, one that I wish had never been brought to the fore. But now that we're facing it, it has to be settled and it has to be settled well because it involves the conduct of all future presidents and and the very makeup and shape of the presidency. So it's good that the Supreme Court is going there. I would note that it's interesting on the Jack Smith side, Michael Dreeben is trying to muddy some of this and argue that the question shouldn't be an outer perimeter. It should be whether or not there was criminal intent. It should be whether or not, for instance, there are specific statutes that apply to the president that he's breaking or not breaking, whether he's been given the advice of the attorney general not to engage in certain behavior first, whether it's a wartime moment, etc. But I still am of the belief that we probably are going to land in this outer perimeter argument in the end in a decision. Relevant to that, Kyle, Justice Kavanaugh raised a point suggesting that he thought that the federal conspiracy statute is so vague that it is an invitation for prosecutors, U.S. attorneys around the country and, and others, to bring prosecutions rather easily against former presidents. Interesting, because that is related very much to what Donald Trump has been charged with. Right. And there was a lot of discussion also on that question about whether laws need to specifically mention that they apply to the president in order to apply to official actions. Another one that came up was there's a law that makes it a crime to induce illegal immigration. And one of the attorneys said, is that something that could apply to presidential statements on the stump speech or from the White House? And his view was that, no, in order to apply to presidential conduct in office, it has to specifically say that. And I thought Kavanaugh is often a guy to watch because he can be the swing vote. Another moment of his that I thought was notable was he said, listen, we don't have executive privilege mentioned explicitly in the Constitution, but we don't think Congress can demand every piece of paper of the White House's work product and executive immunity. Why isn't that rooted in the same sort of place? 